Hi, I'm uh, Doug Baer. I work on the uh, VMware Hands-On Labs team. So we present the uh, Hands-On Labs for the VMworld events, which are our conference, as well as the uh, online portal. So we offer the labs uh, that we present at the shows available 24-7, 365 for free to anybody who wants to take them. And so uh, we basically have 40 minutes here. I didn't think it was enough time to go through setup and get everybody in and you know, logged into a lab. So I wanted to kind of scratch the surface and show you guys what we do have available online that you can just go sign up and take for free. So uh, you can take it anytime you want. They're available all the time. Um, basically, you go to, uh, if you didn't get one of the URL cards, we can get you one of those. Uh, but it's labs.hol.vmware.com slash hol. It asks you for your email address and your name. And then uh, you can just answer a few security questions and get logged in and take a lab. So uh, basically, what you have is a, a lab portal. And uh, let me show you what that looks like here. It's going to be a little sluggish based on the Wi-Fi. But, uh, Basically what it's going to do is give you a list of all of the labs that we have in our catalog and uh, that you can deploy and take. These are live running environments, so it's not like we're running uh, you know, any sort of simulation. They are actual deployed environments. So when you take the OpenStack lab, we actually have uh, some virtual ESXi hosts with uh, our Vova appliance, which is our non-production kind of test deployment of OpenStack in a virtual appliance. But if you want to get an idea of what OpenStack looks like running with vSphere on the back end, it's a really good way to get started. So basically, you've got a, a catalog of labs you can browse here in the portal. If you're looking for anything in particular, you can search the catalog. So you can search for something like OpenStack, and it'll show you the OpenStack lab. Uh, you click a button. You can see I'm already enrolled in this lab, but basically this will start up the lab environment, and uh, you can go ahead and take the lab. <laughs> it's just the logistics here were not very really conducive to take the labs uh, either which way. So if they're available 24-7, it's a great way to learn. How often are the labs updated? So the labs are typically updated uh, twice a year for VMworld Europe and for uh, VMworld US. Um, it is possible that we'll get incremental updates during the year if we have product releases. So, so I'm going to resume the lab here. And the way this works is you'll have a, a console on the left side of the screen and a manual on the right side. You do have an option to flip them if you're left-handed or you prefer it that way. Um, usually what happens is you'll see this screen while the lab is being deployed in the background and you're being connected to it. Uh, so these labs run out of uh, Amsterdam. They run out of uh, Santa Clara, California, and Wenatchee in the United States. Yeah, and we do have a booth, so. Not that yeah. technical, but yeah. Right. So the, the, the main part that I really like about this is the, uh, the lab environment itself. Like I said, it's a full running environment, so you can kind of do whatever you want. You can completely ignore our guidance and the manual and just log in and play around. Um, but if you want to know what the environment was built to showcase, then we have a manual over here that you can pop out and you know, go through. We have a table of contents you can break out and see exactly what is covered in the lab. So if you want to know, you know how to use OpenStack networking with NSX, we've got different sections you can jump to. Uh, I'll start here. You know, say you want to look at the vCenter web client if you've never used that before. You click on that, and it'll jump to that portion of the manual so you can take a look at it. Generally, we have step-by-step -step instructions that show you how to do something. And usually, there's some uh, description in why you would want to do that or you know, the background of you know, what the feature is that you're trying to, uh, to showcase. So for right now, um, I've actually got this lab set up and logged in. 
So this is basically, you know, it's Horizon, if you're familiar with OpenStack. How many people are OpenStack users? So you know this interface fairly well. Uh, or maybe you consume with the APIs and the CLIs. Um, but basically, you know, on the back end, we're running VMware stuff. But on the front end, it looks just like anything else. Uh, if you want to start up an instance, you know, you come to instances. Uh, you launch an instance. We give it a name. And we'll boot this guy from an image. And we'll drop it on our test network. So from a deployment perspective, it's Horizon. Those list of networks oh. were private MN networks that you created with NSX. Um, you could use provider networks as well to attack. Jumped ahead of myself. So in this case, you'll see it starts deploying. Uh, from a vSphere perspective, so if you're used to, see, to managing uh, virtual machines in vSphere, Basically, that instance deploy is going to show up as a virtual machine in the VMware environment. So if you log into your web client, uh, go here to the resource tree. You'll see we've got an instance. We have, actually have a couple of instances running. So if we go back here, we can look at the progress. It says we've got instance that's up and running. If we click on the instance name in Horizon, we can see here's an ID. That ID maps to the virtual machine name in vSphere, which you know seems like kind of a convoluted way to do things. Uh, we've actually got some integration with our web client, so metadata gets pushed in to vSphere, so you can search by the name of the instance. If I search for Paris, the VM gets tagged with the, the name of the instance. And so now I can manage that instance here without having to go in and try to figure out you know, what the secret decoder ring is. And there's actually more information that gets surfaced in here. We go to the summary. I apologize, my screen's uh, terribly small for this. You'll see down here once the tags populate that uh, we push in information like the tenant, the user, the virtual machine name, uh, the flavor that gets deployed. So you can basically manage those as sets of virtual machines. Uh, so you can see down here, I'll drag this over. As so you can see, I've got information about that OpenStack instance pushed into the vSphere client. So you can manage it from this side as well. So from a, uh, a Cinder perspective, we also can create volumes, you know, as you would expect. Uh, if I create a volume in here, give it a name. Um, Give it a size, we'll make a little one. So it'll go in there, we'll create a pers uh, persistent volume. And we get a lot of questions at the booth about, you know, why would I want to run, uh, you know, vSphere underneath uh, OpenStack? And usually that's driven because your developers want to consume resources using the OpenStack APIs, but the IT department isn't uh, comfortable or familiar with KVM. And so they want to leverage their existing investment in VMware training, VMware, uh, basically any sort of VMware experience they have in the, in the organization. Also, we have our uh, distributed resource scheduler and high availability services that you get as part of using vSphere underneath OpenStack. So, you know, if a 
host goes down, we can resurrect the instances on a surviving host in the cluster. Also, we will distribute resource scheduler can dynamically rebalance the instances across the host in the cluster. So, you know, kind of that defrag for your instances uh, as you're going along and running your OpenStack. So, uh, once the volume gets uh, created, you know, we can attach it just like you would expect. Um, my instance. It's all kinds of fun with the screen resolution, running a nested virtual machine in a web page <laughs> against a projector. But so you see it, it's attaching as you would expect. And if you come out here back to the vSphere web client, It's not confusing at all, jumping all around. Um, <laughs> I apologize. You'll see that there will be a, a second hard disk attached to this virtual machine. Eventually. Let me make sure that finished. doesn't want to refresh for me. Um, <laughs> okay, well, it'll eventually refresh. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry? I'm, it's possible if I had two instances that I named the same with different tenants. Oh, you're correct. Thank you. <laughs> Let me go back here. I think I have two instances deployed with the Paris. The first, this one, okay. Yes, there we go. <laughs> yes, okay. Thank you. I, yeah, so in this case, you'll see I've got a two gig volume attached to, to this virtual machine. Uh, so one of the things that we, we do, you know, is our live migration between hosts. Uh, because we present a cluster up to OpenStack as a compute resource, we're able to move instances or virtual machines around within that cluster without disrupting what's going on from an OpenStack perspective. So, uh, so vMotion actually works. You, know, you can take a, a virtual machine and migrate it. If we see the correct virtual machine now is running on host one here. I don't know if you can read it in the back of the room. Uh, we can take this virtual machine and we can migrate it to the other host. So say we had to take one host one down for, for maintenance or you know, upgrades or some sort of uh, task that would require it to, to go down. Maybe we need to add memory. Uh, so we change the host. You know, this is something that the vSphere admin can do on the back end, someone who's managing the infrastructure without necessarily needing to uh, do anything from an OpenStack perspective. So I'm going to keep it in the compute cluster. Pick the second host and say next. 
We're going to just perform a default vMotion, which will reserve the resources on the target host and then move the virtual machine. So we can monitor the job from here and see that it's migrating the virtual machine right now. So while it's migrating the virtual machine, uh, we can still go in here and we can prove that the virtual machine isn't going to die while we're trying to use it. Um, I open up the instance. Nested console decided to jump. And so you can see in this case I'm attached and it sees that new volume that we attached. It doesn't have a valid partition table because it's a brand new volume, but that's available. Um, if I come back here. It's about 50% migrated, so it, it's still in progress. Okay. Yes? Uh, can you go again the for you page in uh, the Horizon? Sure, the volumes page here in Horizon. Yes. So in this case, uh, the way it's implemented is it's a VMDK on a VMware data store. So uh, one of the benefits of using VMware as your hypervisor is any storage that is certified for use with VMware hypervisors can be presented up to instances in OpenStack. So whether that's local storage or uh, NFS or iSCSI or Fiber Channel, uh, anything, we can even use vSAN data stores. Including vSAN? Including vSAN, yes. Uh, storage nodes, uh, you mean like Swift storage nodes or? Uh, Cinder. Cinder. Uh, so in this case, uh, so for Cinder, Yeah, so Cinder process is there, and Cinder is using, I mean, Cinder needs something in the back, right? So, you know, it, so you need Cinder with a driver and something else. In this case, Cinder is using VMDK driver, which is essentially talking to vCenter and saying, hey, create 10 gigs of this, and we create it on VMDK. Yes. Correct. Yeah. So let me show you the uh, that virtual machine, so you can see once it wakes up here, you can see it. It's moved to the second host. So um, when when you first create the volume, it uh, it is not att attached to anything, right? You can create a volume, and um, so that is actually we create a shadow VM. It's just a non-powered on VM, and we attach the disk to that temporary VM, which is just hidden. Uh, and then we, when you attach it to something, we move it over and attach it to the respective VM. So you can see, actually, there are two VMs over here that are just called volume and then an ID. So that's the what we call a shadow VM. There's no concept of an unbound VMDK in, in our API. So we create a VM that holds the disk while it's just kind of hanging around. So we have a a handle to that disk. Right. So, so the VMDKs will are, exist on a VMware data store, and this is our way. The the shadow VM is our way to get to that disk. And when we attach, when we do the attachment through Horizon, we'll attach that disk into the the instance VM. Powered off and most likely does not have anything other than the ability to attach to the 
Yeah, yeah so if you. It's just a placeholder because in our vSphere currently, we can't have a uh, The disk can't be a first order object which they are going to fix sometime soon. But uh, do you need a shadow VM for each volume? Currently, we create yeah. for each volume. We are trying to do some optimizations to get rid of that. So we create a few shadow VMs and attach a volume to them. Yeah, so it's not actually consuming resources because it's not powered on. Yeah. But basically, the, the VM we create, it's got one virtual CPU and 128 megs of RAM from a, an allocation perspective. But it never gets powered on unless some admin goes in and decides to power it on. At that point, there's no operating system installed. So it doesn't really do anything except try to pixie boot the first time, I guess. So you were in the previous session? Yeah, so you can, uh, you can use the storage policies to guide the placement. Um, if you want to create like tiers of service, like this is gold, right. storage expensive, cheap storage, you can do that using storage profiles. But let's say if you don't do any of those volume types, uh, when, we, when you allocated the storage to be used for sender uh, in the install time, uh, we have a bunch of data stores available. Uh, we'll pick the data store that is most beneficial for that particular VM. Uh, when you first create, we don't, well, we don't actually create anything. We just know that we can create a 2 gig or 20 gig volume. Um, and then when you actually create the VM uh, and attach it, then we'll create the exo uh, in a right spot. So you can configure a set of data stores to use, um, but we use internally the algorithms to find out where to place it. Because over life, it keeps moving as well, right? You detach it from here, attach it to different VMs. So there isn't much meaning to control the placement of the sender volume because it belongs to the VM at the end. Um, but but higher case, level controls can be obtained, like gold and storage. Yeah, that you can right. with, that's a service level offering that you can do with the storage profile. Okay. So how is, how is that exposed to the specific APIs? Through volume types. I don't know if Horizon supports right. volume types, but you can use Cinder um, volume types. Mm -hmm. So in the volume type, you will say expensive storage. So it will go and create on your expensive SAN or cheap storage, and it will go put it on NFS or something. Yeah, so there's a, we don't have any types defined, but you would basically, you could pick it from this drop down list if you have it configured, and you would say gold, silver, bronze, or yeah. whatever. So. Nova also takes the input of uh, SPVM, uh, the storage policy volume. So if you have created like tiers of the storage, expensive, cheap, whatever, you can pass it to Nova as well. It uses the same trick. You pass it in the flavor, I think, uh, that, OK, this, this disk has a flavor attribute, or one attribute will be where to place. And you say storage policy cheap, then it will go and create on the cheap volume. So it's the same same mechanism for Nova as well. It's there. Uh, I think the. Work itself is pending in review since I saw yeah, somewhere there in the community contribution. So it's not upstream. Yeah, I think it's waiting for reviews. And if you search for storage for profiles or something, you can find it in Nova. Yeah, I don't know that that's implemented in a lab at this point, but you could probably go in and configure it and see what happens. I mean, the nice thing about these labs is if, if you break something, you just end the lab and start a new one and you get a fresh copy. So. <laughs> I mean, it's a great place for messing around, you know. It's interesting, I was in a session on with storage vendors and they were 
talking about similar issues where there are certain capabilities of the storage arrays that you can use that Cinder doesn't understand. And you, know, you could potentially do something that makes Cinder not understand where the volume is now. Uh, for instance, they were talking about different types of replication. So uh, we, we have the same sort of problem where you need to document operationally what you can't do at a certain level because it's handled upstream. So good question. Uh, so also in the lab, what we have is uh, if we get past the compute and the storage, we have the uh, Neutron plug-in, so we consume NSX in the lab. Um, in this case, if you take a look at what I've got deployed in here, it's probably nothing terribly exciting. Um, by default in the lab, you basically have the green test network and the blue external shared network. In this case, I've created a, uh, a web tier network, and I uh, assigned a, uh, a router to it. So I've got the little... Uh, you know, router icon, and uh, now I can drop a virtual machine on the web tier network and have it talk out. If I wanted to create a new network, so for example, I wanted a database tier network, uh, I can come in here, create my network, something up here and so this can get rid of potentially nightmare IP management issues because this your know, multiple tenants can have intersecting IPs. It doesn't matter. Everyone can create ten dot zero dot zero and dot one and it won't conflict because they're all segregated and they're all private to those tenants. Yeah, so now I've got a new isolated DB tier network, but if I want to you know, be able to route to it, I need to uh, basically come in here and I can add an interface to my logical router. Ooh. Come in here. And so I'm going to add my DB tier network to the router. We'll let it automatically set the uh, IP address. Usually picks dot one. And so if I come back here now, I've got the two networks attached via a router. Now I can deploy instances onto those networks and you know have them talk, and I can uh, do whatever I need to do from an application perspective. In addition to doing that through Horizon, I can also do that through the uh, APIs if I want. This is really the true power of uh, cloud applications. I mean, if you have developed any kind of cloud application, um, the first hurdle of, I think, compute uh, is almost gone because you, you can spin up computes across multiple hypervisors spread in multiple hosts. Um, networking becomes a big bottleneck um, because you run into issues of managing VLANs, managing IP conflicts, managing performance on various VLANs. Um, and that's where a lot of hard one from no one network and just the basic Neutron direct with VLAN managers is coming. Um, so most of the large scale deployment that we have uh, of our customers on OpenStack, they are using at least some form of software defined networking uh, because it gives them the freedom of uh, managing the IPs that becomes really in a large scale environment that becomes very tough. This one is using all NSX in the back end to create all the routers, create all the hooks, all the private tenant networks and all that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so one thing you'll notice is in the lab, um, you, know, you have uh, a fairly small cluster. So you've got a little bit of space to work with, but you don't have you know, a full-blown full uh, physical infrastructure. So everything we have running in the lab is actually running virtual. So even the ESX hosts that we have in the back end, they're running virtually. So all the instances are actually nested virtual machines. So from a performance perspective, we're not trying to show that it's the fastest thing out there. We're just trying to show you what, yes. what you can do and what it looks like. Right? <laughs> yes, please. Uh, I always have to say that because we actually have a performance lab, but performance lab is more for showing how to troubleshoot performance issues than to showcase, hey, this is how fast this is. Um, so 
just if you're using the labs, keep that in mind. It can be a little sluggish. Um, there any uh, any questions? Anything anybody wants to see? Okay. Let me see. I can deploy another instance. I don't know if we have time for it to actually come up, but let's see what happens. Can you give a floating IP to one of the instances? Sure. Yeah, I think if you're interested in that sort of thing, we've got in the table of contents, you can go through and jump to different areas. So the three main topics here we've got are the compute and storage and the networking. And then we have kind of an estimate of how long we think it would take if you went through the manual step by step. Uh, module three at the end is the uh, VMware integrated OpenStack. We, it's currently in beta, but it's a, our distribution of OpenStack running on top of vSphere. Let's see, I got this guy up and running. My screen is a lot smaller than anything anybody else uses at their desk. <laughs> I don't have an IP address available in the pool. So. Unfortunately, I can't do the cool thing that he wanted me to do. So. <laughs> OK, any questions that anyone has? I think we are running close to the end of the session. Yeah. Anything else that anyone wants to know how OpenStack works with vSphere or for compute, network, images, storage, authentication, anything? No. All good? Starts with Ruby. Okay. And if you want to poke around, go ahead and take one of the labs and take it multiple times. It's really easy. When you're done, just and hit you, end. And If you want to try the VIO, we are doing a private beta. Uh, you can go to the products page, request access. Uh, we'll end the nomination on November 15th because... We